All right. So uh, welcome to uh, Talking Sense with DK. Uh, if you didn't know, I'm DK, David Kyle. So um, yeah, we're going to talk. Uh, I'm going to talk for probably around 30 minutes. That's my aim, 30 to 45. Um, and um, you know, from a technical point of view, uh, feel free to use the chat window. Um, there's also, um, you know, if you if you've got a question you want to add, you can you can throw it in there uh, or a comment. I don't know that I'll be able to, depending on how many <laughs> comments end up in there, whether or not I'll be able to see them all, or or get to all of them. Um, there is uh, the ability to raise your hand digitally, which um, if you have a specific question, you can do that. I'll I'll try to answer questions at the end. So also, you might want to write down the question you were thinking at the time. It's also possible that I answer it. Um, so we're going to talk about alignment. Um, and you know, I think this kicked off because it's, you know, I don't know that it, it's alignment. It's the verbal cues that we use to create certain alignments. And there's just been some things that have been bugging me. <laughs> so. I thought I'd, I'd basically rant on them for a little bit. Um, you know, it's it's one of these things where I try to be I, I try to be as in the middle as possible. There, there's always good reason to. It's not like I'm just going to sit here and beat up on alignment. Alignment is important. I, I get that. It's it's where we've kind of gone off into this place where we start to believe that um, alignment is. I don't know stretching it really far magical in some way or that it's going to prevent all types of things from happening and you know i understand we're all wanting to be cautious with our students we don't want to create problems for students we, and if anything we're trying to help them alleviate problems and there are definitely instances where alignment can help these things so that all said it the, the point it, the big point is that this is person specific often so we're not all of those things are true. Um, that's fine. I'm talking about the general stuff. So uh, before I do that, um, I do want to let you know um, I'm doing a where is it? I'm doing a live and online anatomy workshop uh, in September. It starts on September 10th, and it's September 10th, 11th, and then again on the 17th and 18th. They're three-hour sessions. Uh, if you want to join, you can always sign up on the website for that. And since you all signed up for this and showed up as well, uh, I'm going to put a coupon code in the chat window. I just did that um, in case you want to take $50 off and go back to the early registration price. That's that's your bonus for showing up to the webinar. All right. Um, it's my It's the workshop that I've done. Well, it's sort of like the workshop I've done for the last 22 years or since 2001. Um, and we kind of meander our way through the body. It's a good overview, good refresher for those of you who are either, you know your anatomy and you want to hear my take on it or new to learning anatomy as it relates to yoga. Uh, so let's start off with, you know, one of the things that kind of got me recently was saw an advertisement for alignment based yoga and there was something about the way i read that that made me wonder what type of yoga has no alignment was that the point or was it the point that um, alignment based yoga is safer or better you know, honestly, I don't know what the intention was, and I don't know why I took any type of personal <laughs> offense to those words being put together by themselves. There, there's nothing wrong with that. And so, I, either way, it became you know something that I started thinking about. You know, what what is safe or better about it? Is is alignment safer? just by by the fact that you're in alignment and just to be clear whose alignment based on what you know and i i, I tend to i always go back to um 
you know, sort of uh, my sense of it is that the whole alignment story really started with uh, Mr. Iyengar, which is not a bad thing. Um, it just, they're the most alignment focused yoga style that exists. And of course, they were in the West first, so they created this sort of sense of this is what yoga is, like in, in the in the first impression sense of it. This is how it's supposed to be. This is what it's supposed to look like, you know, doing postures. This is it. And my sense is that every other style has sort of been judged against that, rightly or wrongly by anyone, just just by virtue of it being first. If alignment meant that that was safety, like that demonstrated what safety was, then it means that there would never be an Iyengar practitioner or teacher who ever had an injury, just to take it to the nth degree. That I am sure of is not a true statement. That's not true. That doesn't make Iyengar bad at all, or, or any style, you know, injury is a whole other subject, you know, maybe that's another webinar or another 20 webinars, perhaps. Um, so I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but it just creates this sense that, um, you know, there's safety and alignment if we do it. And it kind of like creates this sense of, oh, well, this is the right way to do it. And this is, I think this is what starts to get at what always bugs me about those kinds of generalized statements, it rubs up against my own desire to teach individuals individually as much as possible, as much as we can in a lead class type of situation, which is how most people teach. I, the struggle is real, you know? Who are you gonna teach to? The beginner, the intermediate, the more advanced person? How do you keep the advanced? All of that's, I understand all of that. Um, and it's an unfortunate place for us to be in, in those moments. And of course, this is what has led to many of these sort of, um, generalized rules of alignment and of which I'm going to pick off two that, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about specifically. I mean, of course we need to be mindful, for instance, with beginners. They don't have flexibility maybe, or they don't have strength or they don't live inside of their body very well, you know, their, their, their kinesthetic sense of where they are in space is not particularly strong, let's say. So of course, alignment is more important for those people. Again, another group to put aside for a moment. Um, just last week, I was, I was teaching and um, a student had one of these um, life form yoga mats, which I happen to think are very good yoga mats. These are the ones with the lines for where your hands go and um, this sort of triangular, rectangular shape set up like a diamond on the mat. And she was a relatively new practitioner, relatively new. She knew what she was doing, but not a fully integrated sort of practice. I don't know how else to say that. And what I realized she was doing was she was constantly moving everything around so that it would be on a line. Which arguably is not, it's not a horrible idea, I guess, to try to use that as a guide, but like she was doing it literally. I'm not saying that's the intention of life form yoga mats, but in my mind, it was creating this idea in her mind or it had been transplanted or whatever it was that if you put your hands in this place, you're doing it correctly. And back to this sort of black and white, right and wrong version of how yoga is supposed to be done. And it reminded me, I mean, of course, in an idealized world, we all have a right side and a left side that are in total balance, the top half, the lower half, arm lengths are equal, pelvis that is, all of that stuff is perfect. And therefore we're all in perfect alignment, but almost none of us live in that place because we've been alive and we've had injuries or, you know, genetic things or who knows, whatever it is that has caused what I refer to as my converging histories in, in my book. 
And it, just watching her do this, it, it reminded me of the student I had many years ago um, who in, in downward facing dog, you know, one of her feet was, you know, a good two to three inches forward of the other one. And I had left it alone for a while. I thought, oh, you know, maybe it's time to start nudging this back. You know, I've, I've been a body worker for many years. I, I've made the mistake of fixing things too quickly. So we just started moving her foot back over the course of a five day practice week. And by the, by the end of day two, her back had gone out. And she ascribed that to us changing the feet. Sounds reasonable. I, I, I can't say 100% if that was, if that was uh, the reason or not, but there definitely seemed to be some type of connection with that. So um, sometimes it is better to leave things out of our idealized version of alignment and observe the person's actual alignment or way in which they are in their body and then slowly move towards something and maybe even better is ask the question why why is this the way that it is is it something that i can change or should change is it going to be to their benefit to change it it's an open question these are much harder questions to be asking, and especially in a large group of people. And you know, these would be for students that you know for some time, of course. So, just coming back to alignment, you know, why is it that some people can do alignment and other people struggle to be in that whatever that alignment is that you are teaching? And of course, you know, this comes back to things I've mentioned already. You know the function of the tissues and the joints, um, as well as, as I mentioned, their sort of kinesthetic intelligence, like, you know how it is, you say, step your right foot back and people step their left foot back. And there's some people have this slight disconnect on stuff like that, especially in the beginning. Um, I, I've kind of identified four basic elements that kind of get mixed together in order to create what we refer to as alignment. One is safety. We're trying to create some, some sense of safety, meaning not letting somebody put their body in a position where they are overstressing something. Number two is intention, meaning you're trying to create a particular situation, a sensation maybe, or even emphasizing something. You also have the practitioner's body, as I just mentioned, you know, this has to do with their ability, their skill level, their kinesthetic sense or history of injuries, stuff like that. And then finally, the fourth thing is the system or style. And systems and styles have sometimes differing opinions on what a triangle looks like or how you're supposed to set up your feet, or what the right degree or angle of your foot should be. So those are the four things, safety, intention, the practitioner's body, the system or style of yoga that you're doing, all are, you know, in a sense, converging together to create your sense of what the alignment is supposed to be or why you're choosing to do it. Um, I, I'm not gonna limit it to these four things. These are four things that came up in my mind relatively simply. Uh, and and somewhat quickly. So there's there's two examples of verbal cues that I I want to kind of I don't know push back on a little bit or just get you to think about a little differently. Um, the first one is the tucking of the pelvis. Whether this is in like most commonly in chair pose or utkatasana, um, it's not limited to that posture, but this whole idea of tucking the uh, the pelvis is one that I, I want to talk about. And the other one uh, briefly is knee over ankle, which is, it's both of these are very popular verbal cues and I don't know, alignment cues, if you will. So let's, let's talk about these. 
So I'm just going to, I'm asking this rhetorically, but, you know, feel free to throw some, something in the chat. You know, why, why are we telling people to tuck their pelvis or, you know, the other version of this is to tuck your tailbone? You know, why, why are we even saying this to people? What value does this have? Those, those are the questions I'm, I'm asking. Okay. Aesthetics, right? Yeah. And aesthetics, you know, can come back to um, something as simple as it's the style, you know, or the system of yoga that you're teaching. Low back, engage the core, keep the spine neutral. I love these. This is it. This is all the stuff I've ever heard. Um, someone heard it before and thinks it's the best way. Yes. I think there's a lot of telephone game happening. Move out from too much anterior tilt. Okay. All of these, it, what I wrote was, you know, I've heard release the lower back or the other version is to make sure that someone's not overdoing the arch in their lower back. And I'll just, you know, this is me trying to make sense of stuff. Does that mean that we shouldn't do back bends then? Up dog is out. You, you do the arch in your back to the maximum amount at that point. Right? So I'll just point out, I know you know this already, but I'm going to say it to you anyway. The lower back is designed to have a curve in it. Yes, how much could could is where you could get specific with this. Certainly if somebody has a very strong, naturally has a very strong lower dotted curve in their lumbar spine, then arguably they would have to undo some of this in a movement where when you squat, your butt naturally sticks out and you arch your back. That That is normal function. That's supposed to happen. That's how our bodies function. So the question is, you know, arguably, how much do we want to take out? Somebody wrote up here, um, Tadasana alignment, that's back to a neutral place. But I regularly come across people who are beyond neutral and have tucked their pelvis so far that, and somebody argued for, you know, strengthening the core. That's, a, that's another webinar by itself, the word core. Um, and then I'll just point this out. Let me grab this spine real quick, right? So even this spine, you know, it's plastic, so I can make it have as much or a little curve as I want. You know, the largest cause of low back pain systemically and generally is sitting. Too much sitting. And what happens when we sit? For long periods of time, as the average person does on an average day, sitting in the cars or sitting on the train to go to work, at work, what do we do? We sit at the desk, you know, the average person, right? Most people are doing that. And what's the problem with prolonged sitting is it removes the lumbar curve. Most people don't sit on the front of their sit bones. They sit right on them or, dare I say, even on the back of them. And what happens over time when you do this? You shorten the front. Okay, to be fair, you know, we're talking about, I'm not, I'm not saying that if you get somebody to tuck their pelvis, you're going to cause their disc to blow out. I'm not saying that. It's the, it's the long-term doing of the sitting, the day after day, the year after year, that buildup is what starts to compress the front of the spine. And then the disc naturally are going to start to get pushed backwards or out to the side. Right? We just take that in for a moment. Arguably, I mean, I can make an argument that every time we get somebody to do this to their pelvis, you're adding to this common pattern of shortness in the front of the abdomen. Now, you could arguably say, well, that strengthens their abdomen. And that may or may not be good for somebody who has disc problems. In fact, I'd say, if they already have disc problems, it's probably not good for them. Most people with disc problems, there's always exceptions. Most people with disc problems prefer to be in backbending type positions. 
That's most of them. Okay. So I guess um, I, I, I really just want you to be thinking about these things because I'm going around and I'm untucking pelvis on a regular basis because it's somebody who has no reason to be tucking their pelvis. And I know we, you know, we might say it in a lead class generally just to help that one person in the room who maybe has too strong of a curve. And if they did, they'd probably complain to you because it hurts their back when they do that posture. You know, it might just, it might be as simple as us choosing to change our words or add in a few words. If you feel compression in your lower back, then, you know, tuck your pelvis a little bit and see if that undoes it. Rather than just tuck your pelvis. That's what we do. All right. Um, let's talk about the second one now. <laughs> um, the knee over ankle story. That has a lot of pieces to it. I think the the biggest one, and, and this is maybe applied generally to uh, alignment, is the sense that um, we we should be stacking our joints over one another. You know, or there's some sense that we should be transferring weight through our bones. And that's, I, I wouldn't call that false. But we don't want to believe that to the point that we have forgotten that we actually have muscles that add strength. They don't just create movement, they stabilize. They strengthen joints. They're designed to do this. Okay, now, the other thing that happens with this one is we get um, people bring up this argument that, oh, there's research that shows, you know, if your knee goes too far forward, it has more force in it. That's true. Of course it does. You knew that already. Anecdotally, you knew that. And if you bring your knee back, then that, that force will transfer into your hip joint. Absolutely. Makes perfect sense. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with any of that. The problem is, is the research that has been done on this, where they're talking about force numbers that cause injury, they're usually doing the research on people who are lifting weight and squatting with that weight on their shoulders. This is not a one-to-one -one comparison with somebody being in Warrior. It's just not. Um, but, you know, we can be more nuanced about this verbal cue. Total beginner doesn't have strength. You could, ease, you could if, the, if their knee goes out beyond their ankle and past their toes, that could be very stressful to their knee joint. But an advanced person or somebody with a lot more strength doing it in exactly the same way might be able to be there for 15 minutes. So it's not that the knee over the ankle is the magic place to be. Like, you know, if we go back through and we think of uh, those four elements, safety. So the beginner, from a safety point of view, sure, it makes sense not to let them go too far past their ankle. That, that makes sense. But as an intention, and this is how it came up, somebody had asked me about um, a particular teacher who was encouraging their advanced students to take their knee past their ankle. And of course, it brushes up against one's first impression, which is never take your knee past your ankle. So then they email me to ask me what their teacher meant and why they are saying what they're saying. So that those emails always, the reply always starts with, why don't you ask them? But since you asked me, um, you can make an argument as an intention to increase strength in the quadriceps, if that's something you've recognized that somebody needs, you have a good reason for it, taking the knee past the ankle will encourage more strength from the quadriceps. But not sticking to it because we believe that that is the safe place. 
not just saying it because that's how everybody should be. And I mean, I'd like I'd like to think that everybody gets into the nuance with their students at some point along the journey. Um, I don't I don't typically see that when I ask people because I often ask people the why of what they're doing. Why are you doing what you're doing? Well, that's what I was told. OK. But why did they tell you that? Because I'm I'm that kind of person. I, I kind of want to know why. I, I want to know why if you're going to tell me to do it. And if I'm going to tell somebody to do it, I'm going to have a why. Doesn't mean it's a why forever. Doesn't mean somebody has to do it forever. Unfortunately, students just, they take that on. They, they own some responsibility in this as well. You know, they take the one thing they hear and that's it for the rest of their life. That's the thing that they're going to do. You know, th that is a factor as well. So um, I, I want you to kind of just think about what you're saying and why you're saying, it, especially when it comes to these general rules that we just keep repeating as teachers. Does it have value for this person? If, if you can do that with, with a group of students, that is. Okay. All right, I will, let me see anybody Questions or comments not in the chat room. We'll we'll spend about five minutes handling some of that stuff. And if not, uh, Bridget asked about the ankle. Um, can you be more specific, Bridget? Wherever you are. Um, while she's doing that, um, when the knee goes over the ankle, um, I mean, look, uh, we're, you could, you could, you can always look at the joints as levers. It's a simplistic way of looking at it. I, it's, it's not perfect, but it, it, it's helpful. So when you start, you know, moving things beyond a point, what happens? Force increases. Force by itself is not a bad thing. That force has to be resisted by something. What does it get resisted by? By your muscles. So whenever you, you know, arguably, yes, if the knee goes over the, if the knee goes past the ankle, you're also going to have muscles around the ankle that are also going to tighten and use strength to help stabilize that. That's not a, I mean, we use our muscles all the time. This is not a problem. It's not a problem until it is, of course. Again, you always have to assess who's the person, who's the student, what level are they, all of that kind of stuff. But you're not necessarily just going to cause a problem because the knee has gone two centimeters past the ankle. Most people, even beginners, can handle that quite easily. Quadriceps are really strong. Um, Nisha. But aren't there certain requirements to an asana, in quotes, being an asana? I mean, the why could change how asanas are shaped. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not going to disagree with you. Um, the why changes, you know, are we doing, are we trying to be therapeutic? You know, the intention that kind of ties back into the intention, which is a why. Why are we doing it this way? Do we need to change this asana? You know, systems will say that they've got it right. Of course they will. They built the whole system around it. But uh, tucking the pelvis in setu bandhasana to engage the abdominals. Listen, you can make the argument for, I'm not saying don't ever tuck your pelvis. I'm saying that you have to think of what the knock-on effects of that are and whether it's even necessary. We've gone, I've been saying this a lot lately, so, you know, we used to be very abcentric, and now we're very glute-centric as a society. 
like it used to be, oh, everybody's got to have strong abdomen. Everybody's got to have a strong core. Unless you're the person who do, who should not be doing that. Sure. And what do we mean by strong? We mean balanced in terms of functionality. Strong and functional, which includes flexibility. It's about balance in tissue. It's not about just being strong or just being flexible. It's about having both of those things simultaneously. And even more importantly, is control of those tissues. Having control of your body. Yeah. Uh, let me scroll down to a couple more that can be muscular too if one sinks into the hip with a forward knee. Yeah. yeah. Don't lose sight of, you know, we very, I, I'm, this seems like a, a good general thing to say to this group. Um, we, we can naturally get focused on, oh, the joints and their alignment and forget about the muscles. We can get focused on the muscle, be like, oh, the abs have to be strong. Oh, the quads have, and forget about the joints or the connective tissue or how the joints are interrelating to one another. Because sometimes where you see the problem is not really what the problem is. It's not the cause, it's a symptom. You know what I mean? It's a knock-on effect from something else being out of balance. So keep that in mind. Just keep, when you, when you focus in on some one thing that's caught your eye, step back for a second and take in the whole and see if it's connected to something else as best you can. Sure, uh, Cass, uh, what if they have history of knee pain or problems during the quadriceps help, but when the joints rub each other, the knees hurt? Um, well, the joint, the, the ends of the bones or the joint are, they're gonna rub when they walk too. They're gonna rub when they do any movement. So, but yes, more force potentially might, there, there's another underlying assumption in that statement there, which is, Injuries should should be strengthened around, which is not always true. Just remember that. You don't always, uh, the fact that somebody has an injury doesn't mean that something is weak. It means something is dysfunctional. And it could be because something is too tight. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of this, when you start to get into the nuance, you're going to have to use trial and error. You're going to have to ask them to reach inside their body and understand the sensation and give that back to you in a way that you can process it and then make additional decisions for what they should try next. It's a whole thinking pattern going on there that is very important as a teacher. That's about relationship with the student, understanding them, listening to them and what they say and being able to interpret it as objectively as possible, which is a fun skill to develop. Uh, Wendy, David, it sounds to me like you want yoga teachers to think about why they give certain cues and not to just say them because everyone else does. Yes, you've heard me loud and clear, Wendy, and I've talked about two that just are bugging me, basically. Um, yeah. You, you, you got it, Wendy. All right. So um, I, I do want to wrap this up. I, I will go back through all of this chat stuff, and we can continue on this subject um, the next time I do one of these webinars. If you ask me when that is, I can't say just yet, but probably every other month, something like that. Um, we can either dig into more of these two, but I'll also ask if you have one of these type of things, like an alignment thing or a verbal cue thing that bugs you or you don't understand or whatever, drop it in the chat and that way it'll be there. I'll get to see it and I'll make sure to add that onto the next webinar. All right. Okay, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. I am going to myself and uh, hopefully I'll see you next time. All right.